Our New Testament reading today is from Acts, book 8. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. And so he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb, silent before the shearer. So he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, look, here is water. What is, what is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop in both of them. Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Then Philip found himself at, Az at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news at, little, at all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Where is Christ taking us next? When Luke tells the story of the early church in the book of Acts, that might have been the question believers were asking themselves as all sorts of new people were finding faith, being baptized, receiving the Holy Spirit. It must have been exhilarating and exhausting. Change was in the air. Things were happening so fast they didn't know how to process it all. Sound familiar? Well, it had actually been coming on for a long time before this explosion of the Spirit. It reminds me of something a character says in Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises. Uh, he's asked about uh, how it is he went bankrupt. And the man says, well, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. This is how God works. Pressure building underground, tectonic plates shifting, heat rising, and then boom, the volcano erupts, and we finally get to see the result of what's been brewing unseen below the surface all the time. Track this with me. When Jesus is raised from the dead, the Holy Spirit 
comes first upon the apostles, who were the disciples that Jesus had called. They were not part of the establishment of Israel. Uh, They held no positions among the Sadducees, who kept the temple order, or the Pharisees, who kept the order of Moses. These two groups formed the Sanhedrin, the council that watched over and monitored the membership of the people of God. The first leaders of the church, however, were all Jews from the hinterlands, marginal, common folk, fishermen, tax collectors, hardly in a position to say who's in and who's out when it came to the power structure of Israel. But the gift of the Holy Spirit had come first upon them. A fresh wind had blown through Jerusalem. People from all over the world had been gathered there and were now finding faith in Jesus. And as the story unfolds, the apostles start doing miracles, healing the sick, casting out demons, bringing people into the fold who were previously thought to be suffering from God's curse on them or on their families. Last week, we learned that two Hellenist Jews who were thought to be impure because they'd been too cozy with Greek culture, they were made leaders of the church. Stephen and Philip were elected deacons. Stephen is promptly stoned to death, in part because of his message of calling the church to welcome all kinds of people, including Hellenists. In the first part of chapter 8, Philip has now just won some Samaritans to Jesus. Here is another group that had been considered by the leaders in Jerusalem to be impure. And now we get the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Try to imagine this man. He's probably a proselyte to Judaism. He is certainly a bridge figure in this whole movement of the gospel. He functions as a kind of final symbol of the ingathering of all of the people of Israel and all kinds of in the house of Israel by the work of the risen Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch is included in the way of Christ. He is not in the way of Christ. But at the moment Philip is sent by the Spirit to meet him, He might have thought it was that way. He might have been feeling excluded, not included. See, he'd just come from Jerusalem. He had gone there to worship in the way a Catholic might say, go to St. Peter's in Rome to worship. It would be the journey of a lifetime. It would be, you know, the place you would go if you were a Jew and had never been there and bucket list sort of thing, right, for him. And he would have had the resources to do it, being a eunuch in charge of the treasury of the queen. I mean, he could, he could go. And yet when he arrived there, his status at the temple would have been something different. You see, he would not have been permitted to have entered. Why? Because the Bible said so. That's why. Deuteronomy 23, 1, made it clear. I'm going to quote to you from the lovely, euphemistic language of the King James Version. On account of the children in our midst, you are welcome, mothers. Here's what it says. He that is wounded in the stones... or hath his privy member cut off, shall not enter the congregation of the Lord. Ouch. Long way for a eunuch to travel just to be turned away. But at least he had the consolation that he wasn't the only one. There were others that were turned away. For example, the very next verse in Deuteronomy says that anyone conceived out of wedlock cannot enter either to the 10th generation. Some of you are squirming right now. 
Didn't know that was in there, did you? Listen, the temple leaders were just trying to be faithful to the Bible and keep the house of God a holy place undefiled by sinners. But I'm thinking they must not have had mirrors back then. So the eunuch is on his way home, and he's reading aloud, as was the custom, from the prophet Isaiah in his chariot. This tells us, having a chariot and an Isaiah scroll, that he was wealthy enough to be able to afford these. He was also hungry enough for God that he was reading still, even after what had happened. The fact that it's Isaiah is significant in that... Um, along with all the other prophets, they are continually chiding the people of Israel for their scrupulous keeping of the purity laws and their failing to observe the weightier matters of the law which have to do with doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. What's more, Isaiah is the closest book to a gospel you'll get in the Old Testament. So what passage does the eunuch just so happen to be reading? Well, it's the passage of the suffering servant who has been humiliated and had justice denied to him. Huh. And it ends with words that must have stuck in his throat, for his life is taken away from the earth. A eunuch who could never have children of his own would have read that as the story of his life. It would all end with him. No one would keep his memory alive. And the religious authorities had just reinforced that judgment in Jerusalem. And yet he wonders to Philip about whom Isaiah is speaking, hoping no doubt that he isn't just about the prophet himself, hoping that maybe it was including him among the humiliated, that maybe there's hope for him too, but he doesn't know it without help. And this is why the Holy Spirit sends Philip to him. He represents the church to help interpret the scripture in a way that reads him in instead of reads him out, includes him. Spiritual discernment, you see, is never a solo act. It is always a community of faith that gives guidance under the Holy Spirit to arrive at the true meaning of the Scriptures. And that true meaning will always point first to Christ. Philip makes clear to the eunuch that Jesus is the one who is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. He is the sheep led to slaughter. He is the humiliated one to whom justice was denied. He is the one whose life was taken away from the face of the earth. And I tell you, Christians read the Bible rightly when we read it through Jesus. And when we read it through Jesus, we read that all the humiliated and marginalized peoples of the world are included with him because God raised Jesus from the dead after the world took his life away. There is hope for every eunuch too. And so the eunuch asks if he may be baptized and join the way of Christ. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't the good news of God's salvation through Jesus Christ a beautiful thing? Well, now what do we make of all this in light of this poignant moment in which we all live? I can't tell you what to make of the way of the Holy Spirit sometimes. But it was months ago that I chose these texts, last Sundays and this, to preach on from the book of Acts. Who could have imagined that last week the stoning of Stephen by religious zealots who had confused their ideology for theology would follow the massacre in Charleston, South Carolina, in a church. And who would have imagined that we would be reading about the inclusion of the eunuch by the early church in the wake of Friday's ruling of same-sex marriage equality? And who would have thought that these two things 
would have all taken place in the only two weeks of the summer that I would be here preaching to you. <laughs> Am I not lucky? <laughs> only the residents feel luckier than I, don't you know? <laughs> So what to make of all of this? Well, first I will tell you that the Supreme Court does not dictate to churches what they should or should not do, nor does public opinion. We are still protected by the First Amendment, and we have the right to order our life together according to the work of the Holy Spirit, and that is what we will do. But that doesn't mean that this will have no impact upon us. The Spirit works outside the church just as well as inside. And we must ask ourselves some honest questions about the way the church treats gay people in our midst. We've been quietly doing that already before this ruling, and we'll be doing it more openly in the near future as a matter of spiritual discernment. And I know that even saying that we're going to be talking more about this makes some of you happy, and some of you not happy, maybe, but welcome to church. Welcome to our church, I should say. You see, there are too many churches, I think, that think it's their responsibility to tell you what to think. If you don't agree, you have to hide your thoughts or feelings about these things. But that's not the kind of church we want to be. The kind of church we want to be is a kind church. The kind of church where kindness doesn't even just mean politeness and niceness, it means genuine respect and love for one another amid differences because you can't have an inclusive community if all you have is likeness and like-mindedness. There are gay people in our church already some who are faithfully serving the Lord among us without fanfare. Like the eunuch, they sense that there are some things in themselves that are not changeable, no matter how hard they pray or try. Increasingly, they are comfortable with the thought that they shouldn't have to, that they have nothing to be sorry for or ashamed of in the way they are made. There are many more among us who have gay relatives and friends, and they all deserve to hear in a time like this whether they are really welcome or have to hide. We held a reception recently for all the people who helped our church and our sister Louise during the Ebola crisis. The Dallas County Sheriff, Lupe Valdez, was there. She is a lesbian, if you didn't know. She came up to me, gave me a big hug, and thanked me and the church for all we did for Louise and for what we meant to the community. And then she said, you know, my partner and I have been talking about coming to visit your church sometime. I knew you would want me to tell them what I did. We'd love to have you. You'd be welcome. I was thinking about this on Friday when I got a haircut. Did you notice? <laughs> Summer do. I'd call for an appointment, and the only appointment I could get was for Friday afternoon. The woman who cuts my hair and Kim's hair and her mom's hair owns the salon with her partner, business and otherwise. Right? Through the years, we've talked about spiritual things. I've invited her to church. She's sort of gun shy about church, as many gay people are, because her experiences have mostly been about feeling judged. As I was getting ready to go, I, I was thinking about 
this passage in Acts and about how the Spirit sent Philip to the eunuch, the text says that he ran to catch up to the chariot. Did you hear that? He ran. He ran toward him, not away from him. He ran toward the one that had been judged unfit for the temple. Kim and I talked about what the Spirit might be up to and whether this might be a divine appointment. How might we run toward our gay friends and not away from them so that they might really know the good news of God's love in Jesus Christ? So while some churches are rejoicing over this marriage ruling, we all know that others are doubling down and they're judging. And I've asked myself, what message do we really want gay people to hear from the church at this time, and in what spirit should they hear it? And then it occurred to me that since some Christians have made the news recently for exercising their religious liberty not to bake cakes for gay weddings, I decided to bring cake. So I bought a box of little bunt cakes and brought them to the hair salon. They were so excited. <laughs> the Baptist preacher on this day, and there was so much joy in that room, it reminded me of the rejoicing of the eunuch. And all I could think about is how much I wanted that joy to be in this room too. I don't have all the answers to the questions about what the church should do or not do about this or that. I believe those will come as we consider carefully related matters in a prayerful way together at some time after I return from sabbatical, please. As always, we will foster open conversation and go about it through proper channels that will begin with the deacons. That's the Wilshire way of finding the way of Christ. But I do know that I want every gay person I know to know the Jesus I know. And I do know that I want every gay person I know to know the church I know. And I do know that running toward and not away from these encounters is the way of Christ for me. What about you? Amen.